Well, Pick and Pay released the first set of numbers since the passing of its founder, Raymond Ackerman. And maybe they waited until he'd gone because they are awful. There's a loss in the company of 837 million rand, share price down 14%. But the good news is because of these bad numbers, there's been a change in the leadership and the new leader returned to pick and pay is Sean Summers. He joins us today. In this issue of Undictated, we'll get some context on why a 70-year-old is now the new 50-year-old. Sean, good to see you, man. Uh, it really is. It, it, it's a slim down Sean Summers that, that we see. Have you changed your business practices much from when that beefy guy used to go and uh, have uh, embark on a hand-to-hand combat in the retail game when you were last running Pick and Pay? No, nah, not at all, Alec. You know, the old story in life, the more things change, the more they stay the same. So uh, it's just fantastic to be back. Um, I think you're a little bit kind when you say the results were awful. Uh, they're truly awful. Um, yeah, to a degree, Raymond was spared. Um, having to see this uh, in the flesh. But um, he was certainly well aware uh, of the duress that uh, his life's work was under, as is Wendy. When we have a look back, and I guess this is the most important part, when you left Pick and Pay, the share price was in the mid-35 rand, 30 rands. It's now the mid-20 rands. The market cap, the value of the company, was then sitting at higher than that of ShopRite. Today, it's 10% of the number one competitor. So by any standards, this is a, a, a reversal. Was there any time in those interceding 15 or so years that you thought, mm, I need to give them a call and, and go and help? You know, obviously, I mean, you watch, <laughs> you watch from a distance and um, you see how things are unfolding. And I mean, obviously, I developed a parallel life. I mean, we moved to London and um, I got involved in other personal interests and investments and stuff, and then a time running around for Steinoff in their underlying retail businesses. So, I mean, you watch from a distance, obviously, with a great degree of distress at um, the fact that the company wasn't keeping a pace and it was starting to slide backwards. Um, so, yeah, you observe it from a distance. You know, was there ever sort of a clear reach out, let's get back there? No. No. Um, you know, specifically post-COVID, you know, Raymond and I, we have our sort of six-monthly cup of tea and chat, chat and catch up and what have you. And, I mean, it was very clear and he understood very well uh, that things were not uh, as they should be. Um, and in May, before I returned back to the UK, uh, I spent some time with Raymond and Wendy at home. And, you know, he, he always used to joke, he always used to say, Sean, we can go back there and uh, get it fixed up. Um, so I think it was kind of almost like the elephant in the room, you know. And uh, with his passing, <clears throat> um, I made a commitment to the family. The family asked me if I wouldn't please return and see if I couldn't assist, uh, get it back to where it was before, um, and kind of restore it back to its rightful place on the retail tree. And why did the family wait so long? I don't know, Alec, <clears throat> you would need to ask them that question. Um, but, you know, I can only deal with what's tomorrow. I can't deal with what has passed. And, uh, you know, regrets and should have and could have and would have and what have you, it doesn't change anything. It's not going to change anything going forward. So, you know, we have to deal with the hand that we dealt now. Um, and it's not a pretty hand, as you saw this morning. Um, so, <laughs> you know, the, the other irony is, you know, I had somebody send me a WhatsApp very early this morning saying good luck with the result, but look on the price side, these numbers are not yours. I said, yes, but they will be tomorrow. So, you know, that's kind of the reality that you accept in this thing. But uh, this is not for the faint-hearted. Um, but therein lies the opportunity, Alec. I mean, uh, we've soon got really I mean, great people. I mean, since I was physically back in the building uh, in the last couple of weeks, and, I mean, you go around and you just talk to the people here. We still got beautiful, wonderful people here who are just looking for a better, brighter future. And uh, we can do that. It's going to take a while, but we can do it. There's no reason we can't do it. 
So is it hand-to-hand combat again? 100%. 100%. Um, and, you know, I mean, we ask a lot of questions. I mean, people are like, you know, oh, your age, you're 70 years old. What do you know? What have you? You know, the truth is that the more things change, the more they stay the same as we said in the beginning. And, you know, all of these new routes to market, all of these new channels to market. Um, I mean, I remember when I was born in Cape Town in 1953, I don't remember the event, obviously, but uh, I certainly when I got to sort of the age of seven, eight years old, and I remember how my mum used to provision the home. I mean, she would phone the grocery store, that old heavy Bakelite phone. We had to dial like this. And then a few hours later, the fellow would arrive at the house on a bicycle with a wicker basket. And, you know, you put the coupons in the milk bottle at the gate, and that's how you provisioned the home. So, I mean, what really has changed at the end of the day? So the internet's replaced the backlight side, and there's a WhatsApp scooter or a 6060 scooter that replaces the delivery at home. But, I mean, in and of itself, the process hasn't changed fundamentally. I mean, we're not eating six times a day because of the internet. We're eating differently. So, you know, the good old fundamental tenants of retail absolutely remain in place. It's about the product. It's about the place. And it's about the people. And if we're brutally honest with ourselves in pick and pack, we have over the last certainly decade more fallen out of love with the business and the detail and the passion for the business. And I can say this because, I mean, I still used to go into the stores and I would go and have a look at what's in the bakery, what's in the cheese bar, what's in the ranges and what have you. And uh, you can look at the people, you can look at the pace that people move at in the store. And I suppose the thing that almost irritates me more than anything else, frustrates me more than anything else, is that the playbook that uh, Peter and, you know, post Whitey towards the tail end of Whitey and then Peter at uh, Checkers, and I mean, 10 out of 10 to them, they've done an excellent job. Uh, But they've taken our playbook and thrown it back at us. Uh, Because all of the stuff that we did in the last part of the 90s where we completely refurbished the whole of Pick and Pay, and we took Pick and Pay in that stellar growth path, I mean, that was all about putting fresh foods on the floor in the stores, opening up all of these beautiful areas, dealing with the house brand ranges and stuff, getting the hearts and minds of the people right, you know, dealing with the atmosphere in the store and stuff. And nothing new. It's nothing new. So in a way, we've kind of aided and abetted uh, their success. We stood quietly by, not quietly by on the sideline. We stood on the sideline. And, you know, perhaps the energies and the efforts of the leadership teams that have been here haven't been focused enough on retail. And, you know, retail is detail. It's one key, one door, one store. It's repetitive. It's every single day. And uh, that's the very nature of the business. How have you changed or what have you learned in your time away that you can now bring into Pick and Pay? I had an extraordinary, extraordinary time away from Pick and Pay. Um, And, I mean, the experiences that I had running all over the world of retail in Sinus, I mean, post my sabbatical that I took, Uh, and the move to the UK, you know, when I moved at an operational level, and I mean, my role in Steinhoff really at the end of the day was almost sort of like a roving retail person in the actual, the branches of retail across the globe, you know, from New Zealand to Australia and some of the stuff in Europe and then the UK and then the USA. Um, It was extraordinary to get involved now to kind of done the whole gamut of retail from furniture to clothing to food to liquor to everything. I don't think it's a branch of retail that I haven't done now. So you certainly learn to hone your school, to hone your skills as a retailer. Um, it was a bit scary when I first arrived there because you got all of this image of, you know, this for whatever, you got this reputation that travels in front of you. And then you go, you go and visit a furniture store in Sydney or something and you walk around at the management team and they're all waiting for these pearls of wisdom at the end. And you're a little bit lost as to exactly what you're going to say to them. But then with time, as you like sort of scratch into the business, you realize that it doesn't matter what branch of retail you're in, the basic fundamental principles always remain the same. Always remain the same. And the main thing is people. You know, people make the businesses at the end of the day. And if you look at it, I mean, people lead people. They don't leave companies. People lead people. And... Um, We've had a sad thing with all of these retrenchment processes that take place. Because when you turn people into an accounting line on the PL and uh, you start to do work and you say, well, we can take this out and we can take that out and what have you, sure. 
it looks fine and you have an intended consequence that you want. You're going to take X out of the out of the PL in terms of cutting people. But what you don't take account of are the unintended consequences of those decisions. So you do a lot to destroy the fabric of the organization, to destroy the momentum of the organization, and you leave people very, very disillusioned at the end of the day. You leave people insecure. You leave people not quite sure knowing where they're going. Um, and that's one of the big challenges that we have now, is to really get to deal with the hearts and minds of the beautiful people that we still have here in Pickham Bay. Because despite the fact that we lost a lot of people, and we perhaps lost some critical skills in certain areas that we need to address, uh, we still have really great people. And I mean, that's one of our learnings running around the world in sign in South Africa. We have the most beautiful people in the world. Trust me, okay? It does not take much to get out of people here, okay? They're beautiful in a, in a, in a best. Because there's one thing about us here, us Africans in South Africa, and I include myself as an African in South Africa, okay? 99 out of 100 people here just want to make their life better. They want to make it better for their children. They want to educate their children better. They want to live in a better environment. And uh, if you're prepared to put into people more than you want out of them, you'll be surprised what you get. And I have not seen that nature anywhere in the markets that I worked in. But retail's tough, Sean. People are on their feet all day. It's not an easy game. And if you've had these waves and waves of retrenchment, how do you... How do you start to address that? Do you freeze retrenchments? I mean, we've done it, so we don't need any more retrenchments. And, you know, expenses, you know, and it's kind of, look at the expenses in the business philosophically, you know, I look at expenses almost like the tail on the dog. And then, you know, business to get a little bit under your rest, and then you start cutting the tail and cutting the tail. Well, you know, eventually you end up, there's no tail left to cut. So I'm like, well, maybe the problem's not the tail, the problem's the dog. How about we go and get a bigger dog? And it's momentum. I mean, moment, I don't care what business you're in. Momentum is your friend. And as long as the momentum is maintained in the business, you can do all of the good things that a corporation needs to do to keep growing, to keep on looking at the heart of the business, to keep on looking at the spirit of the business. But I think philosophically, when it comes to momentum, you know, you need to understand in your mind's eye that even when you're really successful and you're really cruising along, there's no such thing as perpetual motion. So you always need to say to yourself, no matter how successful I am, my rig is going uphill and I continually need to put diesel in the tank. But companies get complacent and they say, well, things are going wrong. We can cut back in this. We can cut back in that. We can distribute a bit more to the shareholders and stuff. They stop doing the stuff that they should be doing. They stop investing in stores. They take a little bit more off the table. And then all of a sudden, this thing starts to slow down. And then it gets to that horrible lurching point where it hangs, and then it starts to run back on the hill. And you know, when that happens, there is no cost cutting that you can do that's going to save you. You cannot save your way to prosperity. You cannot cut costs to prosperity. Okay? You've got to confront the beast for what it is. You've got to get out there, and you have to go and trade your way to prosperity. And one of the things I've been saying here in the, in the little bit that I've been here, you know, I use the Stevens principle in that famous Cambridge-Oxford boat race. And, you know, they were just focused on one thing. What makes the boat go faster? And that's what you have to focus on when you're in this situation. It's just a simple, simple notion, simple philosophy. We only do what makes the boat go faster. Okay? We have got no time. I've got no time to worry about what Peter and the other opposition or SPA or anybody else is doing. Our focus is simply internal, what makes our boat go faster. How many outlets have you got? How many people have you got? I'm trying to, to quantify the scale of this challenge. Well, we've got across the group, if you look at it, we've got about 90,000 people in total employed across the group. So, you know, it's, uh, but those employed in all of the various columns, I mean, you've got Boxer out there, uh, we've got franchises as a business as well. So, I mean, directly, most probably in the core company owned run piece of business is most probably circa way in excess of 30,000 associates uh, that you have to look for. And I mean, these are people that have families, they've got extended families and what have you. So, the entire Pick and Pay Corporation, I mean, there are a lot of people involved here. So there's a huge responsibility to ensure that these people have a future, uh, that they have jobs, that they continue to do what they do. 
So when you look at the business currently, I mean, there's elements of the business that are doing absolutely amazingly. And uh, we've just got this challenge piece of pick and pay on it um, that is currently problematic. But I mean, we've been here before, Alec. I mean, 95, 96, when you were around, I mean, pick and pay, you know, post when we had the whole halcyon era and Mandela and the whole new world and what have you, the first major strike we had was pick and pay. And the company wasn't in great shape then. And we had to embark upon a whole process of winning the hearts and minds in the company, of getting the things sorted out, and then getting all of the stores cleaned up. But, you know, these processes are profound and they take time. And that's why we telegraph to the market today. Okay. Because, I mean, I've always believed in one thing. The truth sets you free in life. You know, when you start telling porky pies, you've always got to think about what you're going to say. The truth will set you free. And that's why we said, no, we're telling the market flat out. This is what it is. This is what the result looks like. It's bloody ugly. It's not going to get better for a while. So you're either in for the journey, okay, or you may you must make some other elections. So uh, we see that sadly, you know, one or two have made that election to go elsewhere. And then those are going to stick the journey with us. I certainly believe they will reap the reward. How long is that journey that you're talking about now? How long do you think it will take you and your team to turn pick and pay around? I would say reasonably, Alec. It's, it's, uh, this is a, when I say a multi-year program, it's not like hanging around for two, three, four years. It's not that at all. It needs to turn quicker than that. But one needs to have realistic expectations and time horizons. So I would say 18, 24 months until you see really profound, proper moves going solidly, solidly in the right direction. There are going to be early indications for sure. I mean, we're going to get around the company, talk to the people. I'm going to be face-to-face -face with all of this stuff. We're going to have a look at our structures, our command and control structure, uh, how we're actually running the organization and all of that stuff. So there'll be some small little things in the beginning, but it's, it's an 18, 24 months program. You know Mark Lamberti, in 2014, when he became the chief executive of Imperial, he was 64 years old. There was a lot of comment at the time. You're six years older now. Okay, it's 10 years older. And of course, you get, you get uh, we supposedly much younger than we were. But one of the things he did was he, he shared a 100-day plan that he had put together. Are you, are you one of those people? Do you put together 100-day, two-year, five-year plans? I mean, there's certainly, and I mean, it's, it's too early for that anyway, Alec. I mean, if I had to come and put on a 100-day plan, we'll show you a PowerPoint presentation of what things are going to look like, you'd say, hmm, I wonder who put this together for him. So I certainly absolutely have a plan of how we're going to tackle this and uh, what we're going to do. That is for sure. But I mean, it's not clear as just saying, you know, he has a 100-day plan, boom, um, we are busy at the moment putting together what it is, the basic fundamentals of retail. You know, I don't, I mean, I know what to do. I know what to do. We just got to get it done. And the feedback that you've had from the investment community, you, I must tell you, you've, uh, you've taken me out of the uh, fantasy fund manager competition because when you are appointed, pick and pay was in my portfolio. Whoa, another 14% down today, I'm out of the running. <laughs> Not that I was really in the running anyway, but... I think there are a lot of people who who were who I suppose maybe had unrealistic expectations, and 100%, some who still would. Hundred percent, and that's why today we said, "Listen, we need to have realistic expectations over here." And I mean, you come back. I mean, you know, we'll say behind every successful person is a confused partner because our partners know they really know who we are. No, I mean, they're joking me. I mean, you arrive back in this thing. There's this enormous pressure of expectation. But I mean, let's be honest, because Sean Summers is back here at Pick and Pay, Mrs. Blichnout in Zanin is not going to buy more on Pick and Pay tomorrow. Okay? It's not happening. So just be realistic about it. And that's why I say this is a journey. You've got to take the people along, along with you on the journey. So this is not about a short-term little speculative thing. You know, this is a bump. And said last week when we were talking, when I was speaking to all of our associates around here, and preparing for this week's announcements or what have you. I said, guys, just relax. Don't worry about the noise. There'll be a lot of noise next week. There's going to be a lot of chatter. The share price may take a little bit of a bump. Okay? Don't worry about it. I said in a year's time, two years' time, three years' time or what have you, who cares what the share price was on this day three years ago? It's done. It's done. So we know, I'm not driven by the share price today. Okay? I'm driven by what we're going to do with this company that's going to ensure that the share price is in the right place 
in a year's time, in two years' time, in three years' time, because that's what's important. So for short-term speculative people, wrong place. Are you expecting that your competitors are going to do anything different now that you're at Pick and Pay? Uh, I mean, listen, I have no doubt that uh, our competitors have been working out how they can prepare a nice welcome mat. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that's, that's the reality of life. Don't worry me. When I say it doesn't worry me, I'm not being cocky or arrogant or anything like it. When I say it doesn't worry me, there's nothing I can do about that. So if I spent a second of my day worrying about what my competitors are preparing for me, okay, I'll be putting my energy in the wrong place. I've got to put all of my attention back into the company. I've got to fulfill, you know, on the first day, and I mean, there is a little bit of a change in the world that I was here, because when I left here 15 years ago, there wasn't WhatsApp. But I mean, I received nearly 400 WhatsApps on day one. Nearly 400 WhatsApps. Every single one of them positive. Every single one of them saying, Flip, it's amazing. We want our pick and pay back from suppliers, from the market, from the analysts. And it's just been extraordinary. And the volume of that has not dissipated. Because here's the thing for us in pick and pay. We need to play to our strengths and we need to realize that for the lot of people out there in this country, they still love pick and pay. But they feel a bit jilted. They feel that we've let them down, and we have let them down. So unless you're honest and you can go down and bend it and say, listen, I'm sorry, I'm going to make it right, okay? That's where we are currently at the moment. So we've made our apologies. We've told the market we're sorry. We haven't got this thing right over the last decade. We're going to fix it, and we're going to get there. And we're going to get there first through our people. Then we're going to get there through the product, the range, the merchandise, and what have you. We're going to look at the stores. We're going to look at the strategy that's been put in place over here. And, you know, on the day that this happened, and there was a change of leadership here, and um, I phoned Peter, and we had a, a long discussion on the telephone because I also feel for people. And, you know, Peter was a good guy. He was a nice chap. And, um, you know, I said to Peter that as far as this Ecoseni plan and a lot of the investors have been saying to us, but everything has been about Ecoseni and pick and pay. And I said, Peter, you know, part of the problem with this process and the learning out of this is that when you do a multifaceted change process in a company that consists of four or five columns of things that you're undertaking, if you put a banner, a slogan, or a war cry, or a chant across the top, the two that are maybe a little bit challenged then bring the whole thing into question. So I said, what we need to do is we need to remove that war cry off the top. We then need to deal with the columns and the constituent components and have a look. So, I mean, Boxer is just the most extraordinary business. And, I mean, I remember back to when we bought Boxer and I hounded Pat Goss and uh, and Hugh Blaine, who was the then MD then, you know, chased them down for about a year to get them to convince them to sell us the business. And, I mean, Boxer has just been extraordinary. And continues to grow fantastically. So, I mean, Marek and his team there are just shooting the lights up. And that's in a market where their customers are really under duress. So, if you talk about the reality of the effect on inflation, and I mean, we know that our poorer communities have even less capacity to grow their disposable funds that they have in line with inflation. So, Box has been under duress. But notwithstanding that, it's shown phenomenal growth, doing fantastically well. They're a bit behind the curve on store openings. <laughs> you can understand it because the biggest problem there is that Boxer still has to deal with the regulatory environment wherever they are. So the local councils and the local municipalities and stuff, getting planning applications, rezoning through, all of that stuff, they're challenged with that as well. So it's pushed a bit back into next year for Boxer. So Boxer will have a phenomenal opening next year. You know, Hazel Pillay and the clothing team, I mean, pick and pay clothing is really, really remarkable. And I've had people who I know in the clothing industry that have been commenting to me already for quite a while about the phenomenal success of pick and pay clothing. So that's really been very, very good for us. You know, the whole value added services business and the banking side, that's been growing incredibly for us as well. Uh, ASAP and the virtual online thing, you know, as I say, consumer promiscuity today, you know, customers have both the physical and a virtual relationship with us. So on the virtual side of the business, irritating thing there, 
we were the first ones to start home delivery. And that when I was still here. But uh, somebody else has done a slightly better job of executing that than we have. But we're catching up there again. We've got a great team in plastic. Uh, two really smart guys that started out with bottles. We really understand that business. So we're going to make progress over there. And then we come down to the two challenge columns within this, this broader Ekuseni banner, which comes back to the heartland of pick and pay, the thing with pick and pay written on it. And that is the thing that really anguished Raymond in his last days. Sean Summers, new CEO, will return CEO of Pick and Pay. I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 